So my name is Benoit Le Beau, Le Bolt, if you prefer, <laughs> if that's easier. And um, I'm very happy to uh, be in front of you to uh, share with you some views on the energy transition. And I will insist on one of the fundamentals of the energy transition, what we call energy efficiency. This has been energy efficiency, the topic of my life. I started to work on energy efficiency in 1987. That was my very first contact with climate change. And uh, so I have a long history of uh, the role of energy efficiency in a changing climate. And uh, just quickly, uh, I currently work for the French Ministry of the Ecological Transition. I used to work in the past for the International Energy Agency for the United Nations Development Program and for the G20. I also work for the French, uh, French Agency for Energy Management called ADEM. ADEM, if you ever heard about ADEM. Energy efficiency has been my field for always. And what I like in the space of energy is that everything, everyone does, every day and everywhere, requires energy. There is nothing you can do in this life, in this world, without energy. Energy is the lifeblood of any economic and human development. But energy has some issues. And we know now a great deal about our planet Earth. This is a beautiful sunset between Europe and Africa. And you can see darkness coming on the, continent, the, on the two continents, and you can see the light in the, th in the north, and some in the, in the south also, coming at night. We now have a beautiful understanding of our planet Earth, right? And when I was working for the UNDP, I was uh, living at the extreme part here. I was living in Senegal, in Dakar, covering Africa to support the African continent on the, on the energy transition, climate change transition. And I've learned a lot when I was in Dakar. I've learned that uh, this uh, huge white spot here that you see, you know what that is? That's Sahara. No, you know that Sahara, right? What I didn't know is that in the middle of the Sahara today, you find this type of carving, where you can see in the middle of the desert, you can see some giraffe, some elephants, some buffaloes, and so on. What I didn't know is that 10,000 years ago, Sahara was green. Now it's a desert, right? This is Africa, fairly 15,000 years ago. Totally different compared to today's world, okay? Sahara was a fast forest with big African mammals, and you can see some lakes here and there. That was only 10, 15,000 years ago. At the time, the average temperature on planet Earth was 10 degrees C. That was the ice age on planet Earth. 10,000 years ago, that was the ice age. More surprising, in my home country, France, next to Marseille, a cave was recently discovered. I say recently, but because that was 1990. 1990, a cave was discovered with these beautiful plantings. That was on the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see penguins, deers, horses, and so on. And what was interesting here is that the cave was discovered recently because the entrance of the cave was below sea level, exactly minus 36 meters below sea level. And he took a brave diver called Mr. Koske, who uh, dove, and he found an entrance of a gallery. And he explored the gallery, 175 meter long natural gallery. And at the end of the gallery, he found this cave where he took the picture. The drawings were drawn 22,000 years ago. Do you think that our ancestors 22,000 years ago were diving 36 meters 
moving all the way, almost 200 meters under the sea? No. 20,000 years ago, the entrance of that cave was 80 meters in altitude. The sea was six kilometers away from the current place. That was a totally different world. That was a world of ice age. And when we compare the Mediterranean today, this is what the Mediterranean was 15,000 years ago. That was the ice age. Sahara was green. Sea level ocean was, were below 120 meters. I guess you knew that, right? That was the ice age, 120 meters below. Most of, a lot of uh, the water was under ice in the cap of the North and the And I just sharing that to put one parameter in, 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 in your mind. The difference between this and this is five degrees Celsius. Five degrees Celsius is a whole change of climate. We move from an uh, ice age to a uh, age called the Holocene, where it was a very stable climate condition for the last 10,000 years. At the ice age, this is a, a representation of the planet Earth. You can see the ice cap. That was, there were 100, no, one kilometer of ice on the location of New York. You know where New York is, you know where Canada, there was one kilometer of ice on the location of New York. Very close to that in Scandinavia. Average temperature on the planet Earth, 10 degrees C. This is what we have in, Euro in Europe 15,000 years ago. You can see Scandinavia was under ice cap. There was no British island, no Irish island. It was the same continent. Human beings could walk from the main European continent to this, what's, what's currently the British island, because sea level was 120 meters. 10 degree average, five degree difference compared to today. The Bering Strait were also uh, very different because of a lower sea level. A man could walk from the Asian continent to the uh, American continent, and this explains. So all this to keep in mind, five degrees Celsius. Today, the average temperature on Earth is, five deg is 15 degrees C. Used to be 10 degrees at the last ice age, 15 degrees C. Greenhouse gas is a natural phenomenon. You have all experience leaving a car under the sun and when you enter the car, it's hotter inside. That's right, it's hotter inside. This is a perfectly natural phenomenon called greenhouse gas. The heat from the sun is being trapped by the windshield and the glass of the car. We have exactly the same around planet Earth. We have an atmosphere of gases. And with the atmosphere, the average temperature on the Earth's surface is 15 degrees C because of the greenhouse impact created by the greenhouse gases, right? Without atmosphere, the average temperature on Earth at the surface will be minus 18 degrees C. So we owe the greenhouse gases on planet Earth a very comfortable temperature of 15 degrees C. Minus, minus 18, there is no life because water is only in the form of solid, right? So with atmosphere, average temperature on Earth's surface is 15 degrees C. Now, if I ask you, you've been hearing about climate change. You've been hearing about greenhouse gas emissions. Can you tell me the most important greenhouse gases above our head? What is the most important greenhouse gases? There are several greenhouse gases, right? But what is the most important one? In terms of the damage it causes? In terms of impact. Methane? What? Methane? No. Carbon? 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 Carbon. Say, say, uh, louder. Carbon, uh, carbon, no. Dioxide carbon, no. The question is, what is the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere today in this world? It's not methane, it's not carbon dioxide. Not ozone. 
you've heard about climate change. This is not the first time that you have a presentation on greenhouse gases. Water, vapor, the cloud in the sky that we see is the most important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, by far. Is this a problem? Water belongs to a natural uh, uh, cycle, the cycle of water. Water gets evaporated by the sun, is transformed, is transported into the atmosphere by the clouds, and then there is precipitation. There is a cycle of uh, evaporation, transport, and precipitation. Right, you with me? One molecule of water between the time it gets evaporated and when it gets dropped somewhere, last, the, the cycle lasts 10 days. If there is a warming, if there is more sun coming on planet Earth, there will be an acceleration. But overall, each drop molecule of water will stay 10 days, OK? So if there is some warming, cycle will accelerate. There will be more evaporation, more precipitation. The problem is that we are facing other greenhouse gas. So this is a cycle of the water, OK? It is important to understand that because there is too little understanding of the fundamentals of climate change. And you are not, you will not be able to understand what I, the message I want to convey if you don't get that, OK? The other greenhouse gas emissions are carbon dioxide, CO2. Methane, CH4, and uh, uh, put, uh, uh, nitrous oxide, NO2. And there is a series of gases with very complex names like uh, hydrofluorocarbon, perfluorocarbon, sulfur. Gases that were not existent a century ago. We, human beings, have invented those gases that are totally non toxic for us. But those gases, help us create air conditioning, refrigeration, and stuff like that. So they are very stable, so stable that when they are done, after we use them in the air conditioning and refrigeration, they move up in the atmosphere. And we are discovering that they are very, they have a high potential of greenhouse gas emissions. So they contribute to make the layer of greenhouse gas thicker and thicker. Carbon dioxide belong to another cycle, a fundamental cycle of life on Earth. We human beings and animals, we breathe oxygen and we emit CO2. And plants and biomass does exactly the opposite through photosynthesis. You are with me? So there is a cycle. And during ages, they were the perfect balance between what was emitted by human beings and what was captured by biomass and alg algae. Okay? So during many, many centuries, many thousands of years, our ancestors were living in a world where there was a great stability in the atmosphere of all the greenhouse gas emissions. But what happened in 17, uh, 1750, 1750, discovering of the coal mineral, coal, to replace wood in UK, and the invention of the vapor engine, okay, by James Watts. And we start digging underground some carbon in the form very stable form of solid coal. And we start to extract from underground some carbon to burn the carbon to run the uh, energy machine that we need. And we start to emit more di carbon dioxide than what we were able to capture. At the same time, the co population grew by a big factor. And what used to be forests, forests started to disappear because of uh, the expansion of the cities and the human uh, settlements, okay? So suddenly, when we start discovering 
and using fossil fuel, first one coal, we start to also unbalance the biomass portion of, uh, that can absorb greenhouse gas emission and CO2. So we start to see more CO2 in the atmosphere. Just look how the weight of energy. In one century, between 1900 and 2000, world population grew by a factor of four. We, uh, at the beginning of uh, that century, there were 1.5 billion people, and we ended up, we ended up with six billion in 2000. Two billion people were born since 2000, okay? But at the same time, the energy consumed by the world multiplied by 16, because energy, once again, is the lifeblood of economic and human development. It, as a direct consequence of that, we are emitting more greenhouse gas in the atmosphere by digging underground oil, coal, and gas that was stable underground, and suddenly we start extracting carbon, burning at the surface of planet Earth to run the economic activities, and of course they stack up in the atmosphere. At the same time, we reduce the forest and we expand the cities. So there is less uh, capture. You are with me? To summarize, until 1997, uh, uh, 19, 1950, above our head we have the following. We have lack like, greenhouse gas emission, natural. We have the concentration, this is what we have on above us. This is a layer of the greenhouse gas emission. And we have natural sequestration, okay? Total imbalance, as long as the tap is equal to the drain, there's stability in the thickness of the greenhouse gas emission, okay? You with me? I draw that to show ministers in my, in my work, because ministers don't get that, so I'm happy to present that to you today. What happened is since we are discovering and using massive fossil energy, we have opened a big other tap of greenhouse gas emission. At the same time, we are reducing the drain. You with me? As a consequence, the concentration, the thickness of the greenhouse gas gets much larger, okay? There is not one big tap, that'd be easier. There is as many taps as we have greenhouse gas. We have the F-gas, the me methane, and the nitrous oxide, and so on. In fact, we have as many taps as we have countries in this world, national greenhouse gas energy tap. You all come from different horizons. I saw the list, very impressive list of uh, your nationality. You come from different countries where the emission of your given country is very different from your neighbors. Okay? But we have as many taps as individuals. Those of you of us who are taking the plane very often have a big tap. Those who uh, don't eat meat, don't take the plane, have a little tap. Okay? So the situation is the following. We know that parallel to the concentration, there is an increase in the temperature. We have already increased the temperature of planet Earth by 1.2 degrees Celsius since the great stability after the ice age. It was a great stability where average temperature on Earth was 15 degrees C because of the burning of fossil fuel plus emission of greenhouse gas emission. Now we have a uh, raise the average temperature by 1.2 degrees C. Not very much, but we are already witnessing a lot of damage due to climate change. The situation is following. We know that we have absolutely to avoid a, a disaster. By the end of the century, there's only a certain limit we can afford. So we know exactly the level of budget, carbon budget, we have for the end of the century. 
the level of budget is very simple, you know. We have the term of the equation, we have 40 here, we have 16 here. Can we stop deforestation? Yes. Can we plant trees? Yes. To what extent? We can maybe gain 10 to 20 percent here. But it's an absolute necessity to bring that level of emission coming from fossil fuel close to zero. And the Paris Agreement signed in Paris in uh, December 2019 was to come to the conclusion that we have absolutely to avoid an increase of warming above 2 degrees C. We know exactly how much carbon we have less left in the atmosphere. Okay? At the current pace, current pace of greenhouse gas emission today, we're going to achieve a consumer carbon budget by, uh, by 2035. So the greenhouse gas area is getting thicker. This is the warmest 20 years since we measure with uh, accuracy since 1880 the temperature. And you can see that uh, I need to redo that by placing 2021. We are, I'm waiting to hear when uh, 2021. Yeah, I know it's one of the top five, but I don't know. I will have to revisit that. I'm doing this uh, graph uh, for the last 20 years, and every year I change. And you can see that in, you can only see among the warmest year, you can see the latest. Okay? Climate change is happening. These are pictures taken from uh, 2021 with uh, fires uh, all over the places and flood and, and famine, in fact, in Madagascar, for instance and a lot of disasters. This is, a real, this is a result of today's climate change with just an increase of 1.2 degrees C. If more is coming, we have to seriously uh, change the way we uh, consider climate change. The impact of climate change, you know, it's three parameters are changing. Temperature, precipitation, the cycle of water, and sea level rise. Sea level rise because of the ice cap melting in the glaciers, but also because of um, uh, the warmer the water, the more it takes space. There's some, uh, the, it expands. There's some expansion of water, like there is from steel, for example, the hotter, the more volume it occupies. The impact is huge. Impact on health, on agriculture production, on forests, forests are growing faster because of CO2, but they are more fragile. They burn more rapidly, they are drier. Impact on access to water in part of the world. There was already some real challenge to access water. Now, because of climate change, it's even harder. Impact on coastlines, impact on biodiversity. This is a fundamental map to understand. This is a map showing in blue, the most vulnerable countries to climate change. The most vulnerable countries to climate change in blue here are the ones that have contributed the least to the problem. The countries that have developed North, Europe, Japan, North America, those are the ones who have the history of greenhouse gas emissions. They have developed because they had energy. And they are the ones suffering the least for the time being. This is a map from the NASA. You can find it. The world in 2080. If we reach 4 degrees C. In yellow, you'll have inhabitant, uh, no possibility to, to, to live there. So coastal erosion in red, you don't see that very well. But anyway, we don't want this world at all, OK? We know everywhere that we have to have a drastic action to climate change. This is a summary of um, where we are today in terms of greenhouse gas emission. There is uh, almost 60%. 60% of the greenhouse gas emission come from the combustion of fossil energy, coal, oil, and gas, OK? Methane, 14%. Change lose, uh, land, ch land use and change and forestry. Land use change and forestry, LUCF. Deforestation account for 80%. Uh, nitrous oxide, uh, 8%. And uh, flores, uh, F gas, 1%. 
This is an alarming report from the UN that was uh, released uh, in September last year, September 17. And despite all what we know about climate change, despite the commitment, the political agreement in Paris, countries are make some pledges. Those pledges called NDC, Natural Determined Contribution. Every country said, OK, I will reduce by 18% 18, 18 my greenhouse gas emission by 2035, by 2040, and so on. When you add all what is currently committed, we are on that trajectory, way above 2 degrees Celsius, way above. We are in this world. This is unknown territory. Anything above 1.2, 2 degrees Celsius in average temperature is a totally different world, so complex that even the science can, cannot predict. There will be no room for 7 billion people on Earth if we, warming, if we warm planet Earth above 2 degrees C. Anyway, this is current commitment. So, warming is already there. We have already improved by one point, increased by 1.2 degrees C. The projection between now and the end of the century, depending on our responsibility, what we're going to do with our development, we can decide to bring the warming perhaps at 2 degrees C or all the way to 5, de 5 degrees C. We don't want to know. This is a known territory. We don't want to go there. So now let's try to understand what we can do. I don't want to talk about tons of CO2 and million tons of CO2. I don't know if you ever saw a million of something or a billion of something. I haven't. But I know the following, that every one of us, we produce every day one kilogram of waste, domestic waste. We produce some waste every day, on average. In Europe, it's one kilogram. This is a fairly robust and universal figure. One kilogram of waste produced per day. Every day that goes, and you can do the calculation, on average in Europe, the same citizen produced 20 to 30 kilograms of greenhouse gas emission per day. So when you talk with people on the environment protection, the notion of waste comes to mind. This is a vi visible part. This is what smells bad, OK? But there is an invisible part, the greenhouse gas emission. In volume and in weight, it is much more. But we don't know it because we are told figures about million tons. And we don't get it. Each of you uh, emit, uh, on average, between 5 and 20 tons of CO2 per year. Just divide these tons by 365 and you end up with that. This is my, end, my way of explaining what we Now, what can we do about that? So let's take a very simple, basic energy system that you all know. I could place here uh, your computer, your smartphone, your fridge, or I can place a car. An energy system like that emits some greenhouse gas emission, OK? It emits CO2. You with me? Yes? It emits also some methane and some F gases. Typically, there is some air conditioning in the car and stuff like that. So anyway, you have a car that emits. There are four ways, and only four ways, to reduce the volume of the greenhouse gas emission emitted by this energy system. Can you tell me what are the four ways to reduce the emission of an energy system called a car? You all know what is a car. You all drive a car, maybe. You emit, when you drive a car, you emit some greenhouse gas emission. You're with me. There are four complementary steps to reduce the impact. So what can we do? What comes to mind? Increasing the efficiency of the engine. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, yes, indeed. To transport a person, you can drive a car that will uh, uh, consume 15 liters per 100 kilometers, or three, ki three liters. There is a factor of five sometimes on the energy performance of a car. And very much depend of the, of the performance of the car, is the weight of the car. 
a green car is a light one period because to move a person from here to there the energy is proportional to the weight okay so yes beautiful energy efficiency but that's not enough exactly behavior change you can decide to have a car but to not use it or you can decide to have a car but to drive it in a very eco fashion way or you can only decide to use the car when the car is full of four or five friends all this notion of uh, human dimension lifestyle behavior change very important because we have seen cases where people have very efficient cars but they continue to drive longer faster because the car is efficient so there is a dis difference between energy efficiency and behavior change and lifestyle change there are two other very important options yes the choice of fuel in today's world you can drive a car running on diesel gasoline hybrid electric hydrogen right for each of the different fuel you will have a different impact so we have choice of fuel energy performance energy efficiency eco driving car use behavior and there is the last one We are in, living in a world where we have to target net zero emission. This last block that is linked between uh, the use of an energy system. Uh, shared mobility? Is it the? Is it shared mobility and different modes of mobility? Is it I would put that in eco driving, car use, behavior change, lifestyle. No, there is an element. Not using cars at all. Just getting rid of yes, but uh, be, be, if you still have cars, you will still have some emission even if you don't use them. So. You can capture more emissions, but you are producing either. Yes. The manufacturing and material. Because a car is made of glass, steel, aluminum, plastic, and all that, okay? And at all, for each of the production, you have some greenhouse gas emission. So having a car, not using it, is fine, but... Uh, and in today's world, we know that we can decarbonize transport, buildings, cities. We can move away from fossil fuel. But it's very hard now to also move away from um, some uh, material that consume, um, that emits greenhouse gas emissions when we are uh, 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 doing the manufacturing. Okay? So, what I said for car is uh, valid for your smartphone, except that the balance is different. For a car, I would say that a quarter is on the manufacturing, a quarter, quarter, quarter. Okay? For your smartphone, the greenhouse gas impact, maybe 80%, 90% is on the manufacturing, not so much on the energy consumption or the behavior, okay? Behavior, yes, if you video stream all day, you will generate a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emission. So for each of the system, there is a different impact, a city. So the Paris Agreement, we have now 20 years to move from... Uh, a low carbon pass. So compared to uh, the trend in greenhouse gas emission, we have to bring this world to a low carbon path. And there are four complementary steps. I'm insisting because there's not one way, one simple, let's go green, let's plant windmills and use solar. That's not enough. That's not enough. Four blocks, change practice and behavior. We call that sufficiency. It's not, um, it's a very convenient word in French. We have sobriété, sobriété, to be sober. <laughs> it works really well in France. And Association Negawatt has really insisted that sobriété, the notion of sufficiency, let's try to make sure that we create the condition for the right behavior, the right lifestyle. Okay? Then energy efficiency. 
The combination of energy efficiency and behavior change is called energy conservation. Absolute energy conservation is what we need. Energy efficiency is not enough. And sometimes it's a good excuse to continue to waste. Renewable energy. Of course, we have to move towards electricity and electricity produced out of uh, wind, sun, water, biomass, and geothermal. There are five sources of renewable energy. I don't believe in nuclear power uh, because it's not universal. I work for the UN for international bodies. Something that is not universal doesn't count for me. Plus, nuclear power has totally lost the battle against uh, the economic battle. And improve carbon sinks. We have not only to stop deforestation, but reforest, but we also have to think the carbon that is embodied in the material. In this uh, building, there is a lot of carbon. Even if we were able to reduce to zero the energy, the fossil energy used in this building, we will still have a lot of carbon embedded because this is concrete. Okay? So anyway, this is uh, the, the last part. Just an illustration to, to, to show you how inefficient our world is. This is a very simple system called a lamp. Used to be uh, run by some incandescent lamp. When we burn some fossil, nuclear power, oil, coal, and gas, only 33% is transformed into electricity. Then there is a loss of 10% in the electricity grid. And only 5% of the electricity reaching the lamp transform into light. 95% of the consumption of a regular light bulb is heat. It's not light, OK? So you can improve that by uh, an advanced turbine, and you can reduce the loss, and you can increase. But still, you see, we are less than 1.5% of efficiency compared to what we burned initially. We are in the 21st century, and we are still using system that is less than 2% efficient of all. This is in unacceptable to me. So anyway, there's, uh, the, the, and typically when you move to renewable energy, you go for the most energy efficient system, not, not decentralized. LED, it's a real evolution in the technique, and LED transforms 33%, 35% of the electricity into light, much better than 5%. Okay? So overall, there is, this is what we call energy efficiency. When the country has underground some oil, fuel, and gas, it can choose to extract, invest, and extract. And for the next 20, 30 years, it will extract oil, coal, and gas. When the country decides to go for renewable energy, like uh, photovoltaics, for the next 20, 30 years, electricity will be produced when the country decides to go for energy efficiency and energy conservation through some program, some policies, some project, typically through this uh, A to G uh, labeling scheme, this is a policy, then energy savings will be delivered for the next 20 years. Energy efficiency is a fuel. And one of the drama in this world is that we don't understand that the first margin that we have is not to put more power from wind, solar, and so on in the landscape, but it's first to tap the huge potential that we have in energy inefficiency. There is a huge potential, and it's a fuel. The International Energy Agency has monitored over the past many years the evolution of the consumption. And you can see here, the, for uh, 11 countries, Australia, Denmark, Finland, France, where statistics were very robust, since 1973, you see the evolution of oil, gas, coal, electricity, and others. But those countries have implemented some energy efficiency policy, mandatory building codes, labeling, rating, audit and different scheme. And if we had not done this energy efficiency, this would have been the consumption in green. 
So this is to say that energy efficiency is a fuel and we call it the first fuel because when energy efficiency has been implemented, it has delivered and big. Same, uh, let me skip that. I'm reaching the conclusion with a few slides like this one from the IEA. This is a forecast done by the International Energy Agency, the total greenhouse gas emission from the world energy system. And you can see that compared to a current scenario, current new policy scenario, this is what people have, uh, what countries have in their policy. We continue to emit greenhouse gas emission. According to the IEA and to other, many other groups, we can bend the curve by putting in place renewable energy. The IEA believe in nuclear power, so they put nuclear power. Carbon capture and storage, I don't believe in carbon capture and storage, but I'm willing to continue research and development. And you can see that making the world efficient, making every building, every system more energy efficient is what counts the most. But that's uh, hidden. Three examples of beautiful technology. This is a car. This is a car of the future. This is a car made in France by some uh, former engineers from Renault. And they have developed a totally new way for a car. This car has no aluminum steel. The body, like the chassis, is made out of composite material, the same material for the wings of a plane, of a, a blade of a, wind farm, uh, of a wind turbine, right? So you can see the body here. And because they have a totally different design, this car weighs less than 700 kilograms. You can fuel it with electricity, hydrogen, hybrid, or whatever. It will consume much, much less. This car is called a uh, gazelle, it's a gazelle, uh, and, and, uh, it's a and I have a lot to say about this, this, this car. But anyway, this is just to illustrate. This is also a perfect illustration of uh, the world we live in. You certainly have heard about Bertrand Piccard, who has circled the world with a plane, having the sun as a sole fuel. This is a solar impulse plane. 40,000 kilometers of flight over planet Earth. You've heard about that plane. This is an illustration of the world we live in. This is not a solar plane. This is an energy efficient plane. Because to design this plane, first Bertrand Piccard was unable to use engineers from Airbus and Boeing. They were unable to, uh, to think that it was possible to design a system that could fly with the sun. Isn't that interesting? Same for the, uh, the previous example of cars. To design the solar part, the visible part of the transition, you know, the wind turbine and the solar, it took two engineers half a day to design the surface that was available for the photovoltaics. But to design the rest of the plane, the choice of material, the efficiency of every component, it took 20 engineers during 12 years. So the visible part is the solar system, but the hidden part, but what made this plane took off was energy efficiency and being smart in the design. It was impossible until they did it. And I think this is a world we face it. It looks impossible, daunting, to engage a transition. I think it is in our hand. We have all the solutions, all the techniques to make it happen. We just sometimes fail to understand that climate change is real and that we'd better hurry to put in place the solution. Last example. This is a beautiful building in the south of France. My friends from the Negawatt Association have been this uh, three-story building out of local material, straw, wood, and earth. Optimal design, what we call passive design, triple glazing, solar roof on half of the, uh, solar PV on half of the roof. This building over one year produced seven 
um, uh, seven times more electricity than it consumes every year. This is a perfectly comfortable building, no air conditioning, no space heating, just because it is properly designed, because there is a combination of uh, behavior change, energy efficiency, renewable energy, and material. And the w by, by the way, this has cost very little because as soon as you put the money into the brains, we end up with this type of uh, uh, system. Anyway, energy efficiency comes uh, uh, with multiple benefits, security, health, job creation, productivity, quality environment, capital cost. Ah. Yeah, I will uh, finish by, 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 by sharing with you that we live in a world where we have to move to a knowledge economy. In this world, there are two types of resources. You have the finite resources and you have the infinite resources. The finite resources, fossil energy, mineral, land, land, sand. The rules, the rule is, the more we share, the less we have. Finite resources, the more we share, the less we have. Infinite resources, renewable energy, knowledge, love, friendship, energy efficiency. The more we share, the more it grows. Very important. I share my knowledge with you. I'm not less stupid. But by sharing knowledge, by sharing education, knowledge grows. The problem, because there's a problem, this is too beautiful. Here, the sharing is immediate. I have a, a pack of money, I have uh, some gold, I have some oil, I share, it's immediate. But sharing, sharing infinite resources, sharing love, friendship, knowledge, education, takes time. And this is my one, number one plea to government. It's to really invest in education, in the knowledge, in the understanding of this world, but to take the time not to do a one shot and then withdraw. Einstein said that uh, if you think education is costly, try ignorance. Energy efficiency in 3D in these. These like decoupling by definition, energy efficiency is to receive more services by consuming less, decoupling. Second is decarbonization, obvious in the context of what is claimed. Decentralization. We live in a world where we have to now make use of all energy that is available everywhere. We have to learn to uh, put in place decentralized system, but we have also to make use of decentralized system and solution to build the energy system that we need. Demand driven, as opposed to supply driven. Digitalization. I believe that digitalization can make us smarter can help us share information. Digitalization is a blessing. I am fully aware that digitalization can be an, addition, an additional problem because the more we use digital system and 4Gs and 5Gs, the more electrons and cloud and stuff like that, and the more waste. That is true. But digitalization can also take us to another layer of knowledge, I believe. Disruptive, let's think disruptive. We have no time for small step in this world. We have to think disruptive like the Bertrand Picard and all those who have shown us the way. And the last D is desirable. We have to desire the change ahead of us. I feel like sometimes we don't like planet Earth. We don't like this humanity. We don't desire this, this change. We have to move from the sustainable development goal to the sustainable and desirable development goal. Thank you for your attention and uh, more than happy to engage your discussion with. All right, well, hi everybody. Um, my name is Raman and I will be presenting today with Lorik who will join us later online. He's from Epoch 2, I'm from Epoch Plus. Okay, first of all, Mr. Lebo, I want to thank you for the wonderful, such a vivid presentation. 
Um, I think that there's never enough images to show us how climate change is important. Uh, we were going to start our presentation with some key takeaway messages from the energy efficiency report, which uh, I'm sure you have seen. But uh, we don't really have that much time and there's a lot to talk. There's so many topics. So I will start by, sorry. Did you mute me? Sorry. <laughs> I thought you said that I should have unmuted myself. I think your mic, your mic is off on, the, on Zoom, right? You should uh, switch on. No, no. E e uh, all good? Okay, you, you continue like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I will, um, I will start by presenting the energy efficiency paradox. This is something that you have mentioned, but you have not explicitly called it this way. Then I will speak about the um, policy making around energy efficiency in the European Union. And then I will give the floor to Lorik and he will talk about how we should rethink the narrative around energy efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so the Javans paradox, also known as the energy efficiency paradox, also known as the rebound effect. So what is it? It is a phenomenon that the actual reduction in energy use and emissions is less than expected reduction caused by an energy efficiency improvement due to induced behavior adjustment of relevant economic agents. So this is basically what you were saying about somebody who has a more efficient car and they start driving more. So here's a study from 2014, which covered 28 European Union countries and Norway um, for 12 years, from 2000 to 2012. And it shows that there is a lot of countries that started driving more after the energy efficiency measures were introduced. Uh, so 13 countries saw the weak rebound effect. This is the, uh, when the effect is less than 50%, and those were mainly northwestern European countries. In 11 countries, the effect was stronger, and in six of them, uh, there was what is called backfire. This is when they started to consume more uh, than they consumed prior to introducing the energy efficiency measures. And only five countries uh, out of 29 saw the negative rebound effect. However, the paper says that economic hardship may be the explanation to why they started consuming less. All of them except for Norway. So, um, yeah, that was the, um, the energy efficiency paradox. It exists. And now let's talk about what's happening in terms of policy making around energy efficiency. So just to remind you, in 2019, the European Green Deal was announced. And uh, this summer, the summer of 2021, the European Commission released the Fit for 55 package. And the goal of this package is to revise and recast some of the existing policies uh, in terms of green transition and to basically make them more ambitious. And the energy efficiency directive is one of them. So um, these are just some of the points that the energy efficiency directive covers. Uh, but I will draw your attention to the two of them. So the first one that under the current energy efficiency directive, 32.5% of the uh, energy efficiency savings should come from uh, well should come from energy efficiency measures and uh, uh, this target should be achieved by 2030 however it's not a binding target and the proposal uh, under fit for 55 is to uh, make this target mandatory and to change the number to 36 percent for final energy consumption and to 39 percent for primary energy consumption. Uh, another interesting figure is the, the last one, the mandatory requirement for member states to achieve 1.5% annual energy savings. Currently, this threshold is 0.8%. And what is striking here is that the net zero scenario, the, uh, what they propose is uh, 
to have a 4% uh, annual energy savings. So uh, even the new proposal doesn't seem to be very ambitious in this respect. So um, just to set the scene for you a little bit about policy making in the European Union. Um, lobbying plays a very important role in the policy making process in the EU. And that happens for several reasons. Uh, the European Union closely involves economic actors in its decision making because of its neoliberal orientation, because the number of public servants is uh, quite small, around 32,000. And this is the reason why they have to rely on external experts, which are often represent, represented by companies. Um, and they are dominated by capital's representatives. So this is what happens in terms of lobbying in general in the European Union. And let's take a look at what's happening with lobbying around the Energy Efficiency Directive. Um, this is quite a contested directive because some companies they uh, voice their support for it others push against it and on this slide you can see the, the organizations that push against it for example business europe is one of brussels most powerful lobbyists and together with the european steel association they raised concerns about increasing the energy efficiency target then fuels europe uh, the members of which account for almost 100% of the European Union petroleum refining capacity, they advocated for an indicative rather than binding target, which is currently the case. Uh, then heavy industry organizations such as European Chemical Industry Council and the International Federation of Industrial Energy Consumers uh, they were particularly concerned with regards to the absolute energy consumption cap. And energy consumption cap, if we go back to this energy efficiency paradox, is one of those things that uh, should be in place so that we make sure that after the introduction of, of energy efficiency measures, uh, countries do not drive more. Um, and this is from from, from the research that I did with uh, some of my colleagues, Korhan, Debra, uh, Kamal, and Aulia, thank you. So we studied Enercoop. This is a French uh, cooperative which uh, provides 100% green energy. And on top of being 100% green, what's interesting is the concept of um, energy sobriety that you mentioned. So this last bullet point is a quote from their web page. So they claim that an Enercoop member on average consumes 20% less energy than an average French. Um, these are just some of the ideas. I will leave you with them for now. I will give the floor to Lorik and then we will go back to all these things when we will uh, make the questions. Hello everyone, I hope that I'm audible. I wish I could have been there to present today, uh, but unfortunately COVID got to me before I could get to you. Thank you, Mr. Lavoie for your insightful presentation. Well, I have to be honest that I've played close attention to vibes, but I was never really careful in paying attention to energy. And in researching for the seminar, I found out that most of humans don't. While that was supposed to bring me comfort, it made me feel worse for all of us. So in this part, I'm going to attempt to highlight some conceptualizations on energy from an economic perspective. I want to start the discussion, this part with a quote from Steve Keen, which says, labor without energy is a corpse, while capital without energy is a sculpture. I will we'll use the work of Keen as he has been attempting to redefine our understanding of energy from an economic thinking paradigm. In his paper in 2020, through the use of data correlations, he shows the link between energy use GDP, CO2, and global warming. Uh, now I'm gonna present these uh, uh, figures. So here is the correlation between energy and world GDP. So in a way, uh, energy is a determinant of GDP. So GDP is currently running on energy. Meanwhile, in the next uh, picture, we uh, graph, we see the, the GDP increases are 
closely re correlated with the increase in atmospheric CO2. So our productions currently remains highly linked to CO2. And finally, the increases in atmospheric CO2 have been related with extraordinary temperature increases that are among the main causes of global warming. As the data shows high correlations, close attention should be paid to understanding these linkages and realities in order to better comprehend the re relation between energy and the ecological crisis. While to some level we understand these, uh, these uh, linkages, our economic models widespreadly remain energy blind. Energy is not present in any of the prominent economic production functions or economic models. So, uh, Keane criticizes that, and he has been attempting to, to construct an economic model that is energy inclusive. He criticizes the production function used in existing economic models, where energy only plays a trivial role and is treated as a third input, independent of labor and capital. On his paper with Ken, I, with uh, Iris and Standish, they uh, develop an economic model that treats energy as an input to both labor and capital without which production would be impossible. So uh, energy is directly needed to produce GDP. And therefore, therefore, if energy production has to fall because of global warming, then so we'll have, so we'll have to have GDP falling as well. For uh, everyone interested in uh, equations uh, in uh, energy inclusive modeling, you can, uh, I suggest you to read the Keen as the time doesn't permit to go into the equation part. Another interesting perspective, a more holistic one, I came along while doing research is the superorganism by Hagens. He crit critiques the pursuit of economic growth and identifies that our human culture appears as a self-organized, mindless, energy-seeking superorganism. He argues that our physical and emotional homeostasis, that is the self-regulating process by which organisms uh, feel best to maintain stabi stability and are conditioned best fit for survival. So we are most uh, comfortably surviving is currently right now linked with our energy use. The state of comfort, which human brains aim for in modern human culture is closely related to consumerism. We want the newest iPhone, the fastest internet, the biggest house in the south of France, and preferably a Tesla and a yacht to feel successful and comfortable. Also, we want it as fast as possible to feel as good and successful about ourselves. Instant gratification. We are all in social media. So even our tweets and retweets are energy uses. Well, I personally feel super anxious when my phone's battery is under 20%. And the first thing I do is look for a power source. So for most of people, comfort is turned to have a strong correlation to devices and processes that require energy use. Therefore, the consumerism mindset and the need for instant gratification puts time pressure in the use of energy. And energy in time unit is power. And all we want to do is increase our power. So this has turned our global human society into an energy dissipating superorganism. But how did we get here? Hagens uses a conceptual graph where he, he portrays money, uh, non renewables, and sustainable flows. And here uh, if he points out to uh, four points A, B, C, and D, where point A shows the pre-industrial era where we co were connected to the land, solar energy, and we relied on sustainable flows. Between A and B, we explored the magic of fossil fuel, which prompted extraordinary growth and the beginning of the conflating of the dollar value of energy with the work value of energy, while we forgot about the cost of pollution that came from it. Uh, B and C is the point where we hit the 1970s uh, energy crisis, which we solved by using debt to pull consumption forward and also globalization and outsourcing to the cheapest area of production. Well, point C is the representation of the 2008 financial crisis when the saving of financial markets decoupled money from the uh, biophysical reality of it. Well, the point D is the unsustainable future where global monetary representations of reality continue to decouple from the underlying biophysical reality. So willingly, the pursuit of comfort and power, we have adopted the growth imperative that has relied on cheap fossil energy and unstable uh, 
via physically detached finance. So by doing so, we have pulled forward on consumption and have accelerated the raising of temperatures. Therefore, it is worth remembering that energy is embedded on everything we do, as it underpins all human systems. And issues relating to the so-called superorganism, be it climate change or social injustice, are not problems, are simply symptoms of a metabolism that runs on depth and limited fossil fuel energy. Therefore, in lieu of these discussions, I think it's important to briefly talk also about the existing narratives. Unfortunately, perception often turns into reality, and we have been kicking the can and closing our eyes to the truth for way too long. Sooner or later, we're gonna have to face the picture. So in working toward the best sustainable future, it is important to claim the right narrative. So here I portray a, a spectrum that King uses in her book, which presents the spectrum of economic and, and energy narratives. In one hand, we have the techno-optimism, which assumes substability. Here we have the Elon Musk of the world, ready to profit on this crisis and substitute everything, including our beloved planet. Well, in the other hand, we have the techno-realism, which understands that there is finite limitation. From the energy narrative, we have the fossil fuel enthusiasts and the ones pushing for renewable, green, clean energy. So if we, if we come to energy efficiency and where we can point energy efficiency here, I believe that energy efficiency is at the center of all of the narratives as it can be useful to all the narratives. That is why it makes it a complex issue. Energy efficiency can be used with aim of producing energy consumption or be a simple way of reducing costs. The danger and complexity remains in understanding that we don't need energy to be cheaper. We need it to stop the use of fossil fuel energy and decouple our economies as much from fossil fuel finite energy use, which is destroying our planet. If we find ways to use energy efficiency in that direction, then it can be beneficial. Otherwise, it can just trigger rebound effects that would create more opportunities for energy use Therefore, we should be careful and we should embrace the right narratives that understand these realities of our planet and society overall. And we should push forward policies that are aligned with these narratives. I want to close this part of the discussion with another quote, which I think nicely uh, encapsulates the discussion around uh, the concepts I, I presented. Uh, this is from E.O. Wilson, which is considered the father of sociobiology. He says, the problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And we have to coordinate between all of these in order to, to uh, get in a sustainable, sustainable and safe uh, path for our planet. And now we can move to the part of the question. Thank you. Roman can take it from here. Okay, thank you, Lorik. Um, so yes, based on what we have presented, we have come up with three questions. And I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will read them to you. Um, so the first one is, there's quite a large number of organizations that participate There's quite a large number of organizations that participate in policy making in the European Union. And many of them claim to be working towards carbon neutrality and the green transition, while lobbying data indicate that they fight against it. What is your take on the current policy making around energy efficiency in the European Union? The second question, with many of the organizations dependent on fossil fuels and pushing back against more stringent energy efficiency legislation, what do you think is the role of cooperative movement in promoting energy efficiency and the green transition overall? And the last question is, in the goal of realigning of our economies to end the current energy blindness, can energy efficiency deliver on the necessary energy level reductions for tackling the forthcoming ecological crisis? And what would be the fastest and most efficient way to structurally center energy efficiency as a viable and sustainable policy prospect. Thank you. I, 
Uh, I've been doing energy efficiency all my life, all my life. Just for you, uh, when I was a young engineer at ADEM, I was involved in the very first European greenhouse gas program, uh, abatement program, the very first climate change program of the European Union, and I was part of the team that designed the labeling of energy performance. A, B, C, D on fridges, air conditioning, and all that. You may have seen this label A, B, C, D. This is a result of my work. I was intimately involved, and I can tell you all about the difficulties. And um, because I've done that, that took me to the international, um, to some international uh, carry after that. But what I take from this time is that I've always feel, I always felt that in this world, I was a puppet. I was invited, and I continue to be invited to some conferences where they talk about big business, big energy systems, and they need to have a, a green guy. They need to have an energy efficiency expert. They need to have someone who can talk with passion about the importance of energy. So uh, they give me the floor. I I'm on my way for last week, two weeks ago, uh, I don't know, before Christmas, I intervene uh, for a conference in uh, India, remotely. I'm on my way to a conference in South, uh, Saudi Arabia. No, uh, 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 early, uh, and over the last 30 years, I've always been the guy, the nice guy, you know, the, the bold guy, uh, sharing interesting facts, but they, they don't care. They don't care. There is not an understanding of the urgency of climate change. This is why I always go back to the fundamentals of climate change, because if we don't understand the fundamentals, we are not likely to absorb the policy change that we need to organize. And, and, and I will always try to explain that without energy efficiency, we will never get to where we need to go. And, um, and that's not the small task. That's not a task. And my claim today is that um, to give energy efficiency a chance, and oftentimes we don't give energy efficiency a chance. We, yes, we invite people like me, we uh, sometimes pay for their salary, we uh, invite them to uh, make reports, or I produce so many reports on the beauty of energy efficiency. But for nothing, I'm fully aware of that. And um, the, the question about the lobby is uh, absolutely huge. I, um, uh, I feel like, uh, you see, I'm a, a, a ballet dancer, you know, sometimes in front of some uh, international conferences where they talk about uh, the total and the shell and the Exxon and so on. And then they give the floor to Mr. Lebeau from the UN or from the IEA or from the G20 and so on. And I tried and... and this is, this is a joke. This is really annoying. I should not tell you that, but uh, it's better to be frank. And um, we are far from a position where the world has understood what it will take to, uh, uh, to deviate from uh, greenhouse gas emission. And uh, as long as I see that energy efficiency is not treated as it should, energy efficiency should be every decision, no decision in anywhere in city planning, in industry, in uh, transport, in education, no decision should be taken without energy efficiency. You see the margin of progress that we have to go? Even you, maybe today you are discovering what is energy efficiency. You are discovering that it's not enough to, to put windmills and photovoltaics in the landscape that it's much more important that we have to look at the fundamentals of our society, what we need. We don't need energy in this world. We need the service that energy provides. And the service is not, not too many. Heat, cold, light, mechanical force, communication. That's all what we are using energy for. Heat, cold, light, mechanical forces and, and communication. And we have to continue to uh, make use of those services in the most in energy efficient manner. So this is why I will... Uh, uh, education is key. Education is... Uh, the, the, uh, education <laughs> on the reality of climate change is very important. But right after that, education on the 
complexity. I must say that I have sometimes some difficulties with my own partners, my own energy efficiency community. Sometimes they pretend that it is simple. I claim the total opposite. Energy efficiency is more complex than nuclear power. You know nuclear power is very complex. You know, you have to have uh, this, uh, you have to prepare the fuel and you have to have to this huge machine and this cycle of all. It's very complex. Energy efficiency is much more complex than that because energy efficiency combines technology, behavior. Sometimes we um, have no knowledge whatsoever. If I ask you where, how far can you go in energy efficiency, no, none, of, uh, none of you could reply to that question because we don't have the, 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 the elements. So this notion of knowledge is very important. So uh, I'm afraid that we haven't yet produced a narrative on energy efficiency that is attractive enough, sexy enough. I can see, I can hear in the speeches of the policy makers, of the ministers, of the European Commission, yes, energy efficiency is really important, but they it's a concept. They know it is important, but they don't know how it, it translates. And, um, you know, it took a country like France 30 years to develop its nuclear industry. It was a massive investment at the start in brains, in education, in institutions, in international collaboration to start putting in place the elements for a nuclear power plant. I claim that we have to have the same type of effort, long-term effort, because energy efficiency doesn't deliver quickly. Yes, I can switch all the lamps here, replace with LED lamp, and I can have an impact. But to go at the level of energy efficiency that we need to, to, to be, uh, there's much more than just relamping that we need. Redesigning, uh, reshaping, uh, controlling, uh, more insulation and stuff like that. And, 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 and we don't have that uh, knowledge. So uh, I, I, I don't remember exactly the question, uh, but that was about... Uh, yeah. the first one. A few years ago, I've been very impressed by... Uh, there's a quite a large number of organizations that participate in policy making in the EU. Oh, yes. Many of them claim to be working towards carbon neutrality and green transition while lobbying data indicate that they fight against it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the complex dimensions I just mentioned is that we can no longer be happy with a small step. We change the lamp and we declare victory. Uh, we uh, move to an uh, electric car just one step, you know, there's much more to be compatible with the, the, the target. And um, greenwashing is really bad. I, I, I insisted on the behavior change and lifestyle change, right? I insisted because to avoid the rebound effect, energy efficiency is not enough. So lifestyle and behavior change. We have to communicate. We have to educate, communicate. But the general economy, you know, they communicate, they use the commercial. Do you have any idea of how many commercials each of you perceive per day on average? You live in Paris this year. Do you have any idea of how many commercial, you know, commercial that insist that you by this, that you consume that, that you spend your weekend there. Do you have any idea of how many commercials are reaching you every day? This is uh, social, so, social uh, 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 data provided by some social uh, uh, scientists. Between 1,200 and 1,500 commercial messages per day. 90 9% of all these messages is consume more. Buy this new iPhone 13 or 15, or I don't know. Go and spend your weekend in Marrakesh. Eat this. Go. It's all about the whole economic system is 
to push us to consume more. How can you think that the notion of energy efficiency, of sobriety, sufficiency can be hurt? We cannot compete. I've been involved, I told you, in the design of the A, B, C, G scale. Next time you see that on a fridge, you think about me. Because I can, there's, there's my signature on that. But I always say that it's not enough. When we did that for white good appliances, I said we shall do that on cars. My colleagues were laughing, ha ha, not possible on cars. Now you have that on cars. Now you have that on buildings. And I pretend that we should do much more than that. We should tattoo the label on cars, because very few people are purchasing brand new cars. We often time purchase second-hand cars. And not only that, but in Paris, you may have seen that there is a label, depending on the pollution of cars, it's called crit air. So not only they have not listened to me at the EU, where we should have tattooed the energy performance of the car, but we have invented in France another scale called crit air, between uh, zero, one, two, three. What is this? And, and this is where, you know, energy efficiency gets diluted and, and, and I'm very unhappy with that. I propose that we uh, make mandatory that whenever there's a commercial, they can continue to make commercial. But like for fighting alcohol or smoking, we have progressively forbidden, we have uh, forbid we have progressively forbid the use of commercial. And now, in fact, in the packaging, you see, smoking kills or a drink is no good for your health and stuff like that. I think that we have to reach where, a point where whatever we do on commercial, if there's a link with climate change, there's got to be an A, G, scale, whatever. I'm sure that the commercial people, they hate me, you know, the, in the commercial world, the, 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 in the advertisement, the advertising committee, they hate me. But that's, I, don't care, I don't care. I think we have to reach that. You know, uh, it'd be very annoying because it's not the same when you have a beautiful. Uh, have you ever saw on TV, on the movie, a commercial for a car? Commercial for a car, the car is always full with happy people. Couple driving, kids in the, happy people. How often do you see a car full of people? How often do you see people with happy faces driving their car? And you see the roads always empty. Beautiful, that's always empty. And we absorb that, we accept that. That's not the reality. But this is 99% of what we saw, we can see on commercial. You see what I mean? So changing this is part of what it will take. I, I, we cannot continue the way we, it is, so it's, it's a serious concern. So why we have to find ways to embed this notion of climate change and what I call energy efficiency um, in order to help the climate. When I see this question, also the first question um, after my, uh, I, I, I mentioned this uh, advertisement, but I also have in mind this article from Professor Henry there is a professor, Henry, in, in, in Lyon, in the University of Lyon, and he said, climate change is about three things. One, energy efficiency and uh, lifestyle behavior change, renewable energy, and the third part is to organize the bankruptcy of all coal and gas sector. It's, we have to put in mind that the ulti uh, ultimately we want to organize a smart bankruptcy of those sectors. There's no way around. And uh, I, I think he's right. I think he's right. But those companies, those organizations, those businesses that need to move away from uh, business as usual, they need to get bankrupt. It's a fight against life. This is why they are very well organized. This is why they put some green paint on some activity and they continue to do the rest because it's a question of survival. We, uh, the bankruptcy, uh, I think what we, have, what we are facing is something similar to what happened in the US two centuries ago, in the US, the United States. Two centuries ago, there was a civil war 
because the South wanted to continue to use slave. The North wanted to get rid of slavery, right? You heard, you heard about the secession war and so on. And it was impossible for the farmers of the South using slaves to, for, for their businesses to think that they could manage their production of cotton and so on without slaves. And they had a war, they had a war. And it is at this type of level that I think we are um, facing a change in this world. It is a fight for survival and we, um, uh, yes, in fact, they had a civil war in the US to get rid of the problem. And you know what happened? The North decided to go without slaves and slavery, right? And they have invented the machines and suddenly they were more productive this is why the transition to this low carbon society can be extremely positive in terms of uh, job creation and multiple benefits of all sorts. What's difficult is the transition. It's really difficult to engage this transition and it's a, uh, it's a fight against, uh, against survival. I have no idea if I took care of uh, question number one, but that's my answer anyway. With many of the organizations dependent of uh, fossil fuel and pushing back against more stringent energy efficiency legislation, what do you think is the role of cooperative movement in promoting energy efficiency in the green energy overall? Well, I'm all in favor of cooperative movement. You mentioned Enercop. I, um, I have close connection with Enercop. I, um, I help them, I, uh, I, I'm helping them. I'm, uh, I purchase my electricity at Enercop and I would advise each of you to uh, do the same. This is a very simple first thing you can do, like you can change your phone operator with just one phone call. You can change your electricity provider with just one phone call in France and go to Enercop. You may pay a little more, maybe 15, 20%. But they will invite you to also uh, save energy and uh, at home I save uh, as much as I can. So I, the, the bill is at, le, at least uh, is very acceptable. Anyway, cooperative, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor. Uh, I, among the Ds, I insisted that uh, we have to decouple, decentralize, digitalize. Decentralize, I think we have to bring the level of decision at the smallest level. In a country like France, things are very uh, centralized, policy centralized. We have a very powerful national authorities. And sometimes I, I think the German model, the Swiss model is, that is dis decentralized, delocalized, you see, it, it is um, uh, much better for the energy transition. In France, when there is a wind farm being um, built there's a lot of controversy. There is people in Germany, in Denmark, in Switzerland, none. Because the decision, the, uh, in Germany, half of the investment in renewable energy is made by local people, communities, local businesses, municipalities. And, and this notion of uh, cooperative, uh, bringing the response at the state level, at the territorial level, I think it's very interesting and much more needs to be organized. I know that in France, the law, the law doesn't facilitate investment by local authorities. So if we have even to change the law in the way we can borrow money, I'm not uh, fully comfortable with that, but I know that there's a big difference between France and Germany in terms of uh, the financial condition and access to money when you are a community. And this explains that uh, there is much more renewable energy in Germany, while there is less wind and less sun than in France. And in France, we have a centralized. So anyway, this notion of decentralization, bringing the decision at the uh, level of a cooperative movement is certainly uh, of interest. Uh, is, that, is that enough or do you want more on that question? In the goal of realigning our economies to end the current uh, energy blindness, uh, can energy efficiency deliver 
on the necessary energy level reduction for tackling forthcoming ecological crises. What would be the fastest, most efficient way of uh, structurally centering energy efficiency as a viable and sustainable policy prospect? Um, I'm fully convinced that without energy efficiency and without massive energy efficiency, we are not going to solve much of this problem in the world. We're going to do some greening here and there, but we're going to hit the wall and it's going to be a disaster. So, um, uh, and, and one of the challenges is that energy is much more complex than we can think of because it requires a, a lot of inter intervention and different layer of uh, uh, policy also. And, and um, and energy efficiency, we can not only, it's either the full potential or we don't do it. The worst in energy efficiency is just when you do a small step. Like uh, we have a problem in a country like France, we have a very old building stock. Building accounts for 40% of the greenhouse gas emission in a country like France. We have to bring that to zero by 2050, we have 28 years to refurbish, retrofit all the existing stock of buildings. And for government, it's very hard to put in place a policy framework. So there's a lot of program in France, you can see the commercial way. You, can, um, you have some incentive to replace your windows or change your boilers. This is wrong, this is wrong. By just making some small steps, small move, we will never do the big picture. And at, um, with our friends from the Negawatt Association, we are trying to frame, shape, design, propose the policy framework that package the whole intervention. We don't want every window to, to be replaced by triple, or the, triple glazing, for instance. We want the whole building to be triple glazing, insulated, uh, change. Uh, the incentive to change your boiler, your boiler. The last thing you have to do is to change the boiler. You first have to reduce the amount of energy you need to consume. And then come the decision to change the boiler. And sometimes we, we have seen cases where you can get rid of boilers and put uh, just a smaller wood furnace, for instance. But there isn't some public incentive, public policy today to just uh, go and change your boiler. Well, and, and this is why it is very complex. You, you understand what, what, what I mean by, by, by that? So we are interested only in the big picture. What is the fastest, most efficient way um, to center energy efficiency? Give energy efficiency a chance. Put that in every academic sector. There's, uh, it makes no sense to train, educate people at all level if we don't take... There's huge job creation, huge job creation in the greening of the economy. This should be the top priority. We, um, there's a factor 10 between the job that you can create by trying to encourage energy efficiency at all level than to uh, encourage a new uh, nuclear power plant or coal power plant and stuff like that. So the, for government, this should be the number one priority, job creation, but it's a long-term investment at all level. I, I hope I, reply, I try to reply to your complex question, but I did what I can. So first of all, thank you very much for your talk. I was very, very pleased to hear your view because, to be honest, when I heard the title first and was thinking of energy efficiency, I was thinking of a lot of people who have used in the past, and as you yourself mentioned, have used energy, energy efficiency to kind of greenwash and say, oh, here's this small efficiency thing, the light bulb idea, and then we've solved our green, green problem. So I really, really enjoyed your, your, your talk where you really put forward these critical things and it is true energy efficient